you everyone for coming. Uh, so yeah, my name is Lizlot. I'm going to be talking to you about a recent, sorry, yeah, a recent investigation I did for Le Monde. It was a 10-minute video that you can find on YouTube. And it was very fun to do, so I hope you can find some fun in it and maybe some inspiration for your own investigations in the future. So yeah, it was an investigation, as you've read, about cocaine smuggling, which is a pretty tricky topic to cover with Odint. I'll just share why uh, in a few minutes. So yeah, I'm working for Le Monde and we are doing video investigations. So basically Le Monde, as you maybe know, is mainly a website and a newspaper, but we also have a video unit that, uh, that publishes videos uh, every day now on YouTube and on the website as well. So I work for them. Uh, and we are with the OSINT specialist, let's say, or journalists, we are three and a supervisor full time. Um, this is the kind of investigations that we do. We cover many topics ranging from police violence in France, reconstructing events and demonstrations, but also working on mercenaries Wagner or tracking down how Frontex is maybe, um, I don't know, uh, putting people in danger in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, things like that. So if you have a chance or, in, or if you're interested, you can find us on YouTube using this link or just typing, I don't know, Le Monde on YouTube, it's pretty easy. And we also have uh, a dedicated page on Le Monde's website. Um, so yeah, this is me as Sylvain very kindly mentioned and thank you again, Sylvain, for organizing all this. So yeah, I'm investigative journalist, also president of Open Facto Nonprofit, and a trainer. So yeah, uh, cocaine smuggling, it's an interesting, I mean, I find it interesting. If you're here, maybe you find it interesting too. Um, how do you get started uh, with such an investigation? Of course, yeah, you have maybe this sort of hint or good, oops, sorry. Um, you need to find a good story. So I came across, um, maybe you know, this overseas territory in France called Guyane, which is located in the South American continent. And from there, a lot of the cocaine that's consumed in France is coming from. So roughly 20% of the cocaine that is in France comes, or, I mean, transited through Guyane. So I was you know, wondering, maybe that's a good story to dig in. So yeah, uh, basically what I wanted to do was to study the supply chain for the cocaine that transits through Guyane. And so basically understand where it comes from, through which hubs it transits before arriving to France. Basically just tracking down where the cocaine is coming from. But then once you have this sort of ID, you need to understand what you're looking for. So maybe in this supply chain, we know a lot about what's going on inside France. Let's say, I don't know, the dealers on Snapchat trying to sell drugs and things like that. This has been covered a lot in the media already. And the police in France are also like publishing maybe reports and numbers about the seizures they're doing in France. But what is less documented or less known is what happens before that. So that was what I was interested about. Also, you need to assess if it is doable, if it is feasible in terms of workload, especially as a journalist, because even though we have the privilege at Le Monde to have quite a lot of time to work and study and research our topics, we still have deadlines. So you need to have that in mind and assess if this is a feasible project in terms of workload. Yep, so just a few leads on how I got started on this. There was quite a lot of local media reporting about what was going on in the overseas territory of France, Guyane, uh, and also previous traditional reporting about how it's going on there and what are the causes of why so many young people in this territory are basically swallowing cocaine uh, ovules or like capsules inside their body, boarding on planes to Paris, and then expulsing this drug once they arrive either in Paris or in another, in another small town of France to then provide the network with the product. What I found and what was interesting to me is that one of the ways the cocaine goes from Colombia, which is the production area, to Guyane was through small tourism planes. They are just, you know, 
It's basically small illegal planes that go across jungles and forests to illegal airstrips. And I, I, I came across this in previous reports and I, was, I wanted to apply the techniques to track them to this specific context. And I found a few other OSINT investigators who also tried to do that and managed to find some information. So I was like, okay, this is maybe doable. Also, I knew that this was Guyane, so French territory, so I can speak French. I'm French, maybe it's a territory easier to access or to, I don't know, investigate on. Also, I was a bit, yeah, sorry. Um, I was maybe a bit optimistic, but I was hoping that some sources would give me, I don't know, internal documents or reports because also I'm a journalist, so I do OSINT a lot, but I also rely on maybe leaks or uh, whistleblowers or people that would send you sensitive or confidential documents that would back or feed a story with more interesting detail. That didn't happen. Uh, so basically the investigation is like 98% pure open source. Just, I just got a few numbers from the authorities on like the most recent seizures, etc. but like no one gave me any sort of confidential information. So everything I'm going to show you is completely replicable. You can just do it again yourself. Everything is online. You can find everything. Those are one of the few reports that were popping up when you were doing some basic online searches, many, many articles about quite big cocaine seizures in Guyane. Um, so it was the first step was kind of collect all of this. And there were some very clickbaity titles like this. So I'm going to translate Guyane is the new narco district, uh, basically in France. So I was trying to understand with this investigation why this place became such a hub, such a big hub for cocaine smuggling, where this cocaine is coming from exactly and how it transits to this territory and then how the system in general works uh, for, I mean, this is a business, it's an illegal business, but it's still a business. So you need to understand how it works in order to conduct your investigation. Yep. So one of the things you can do very easily is finding visual evidence surrounding this business. And one of the first th things that I did was identifying, uh, so this is between quotes, but it's, I didn't know how to describe them otherwise, cocaine influencers. Uh, <laughs> so basically Guyane, uh, I don't know if you have the map in mind, I didn't put it here, which is a bit stupid, but basically you have the north facade of the American continent, you have Guyane, and just bordering Guyane, you have a country named Suriname. And Suriname is a former Dutch colony, and Guyane is still France. And basically, what I've learned pretty rapidly is that the, Guyane, the cocaine coming into Guyane comes from this neighboring country, Suriname. So interesting for me is, you know, I'm trying to track where it comes from. So first step before France is, is Suriname. And in Suriname, well, you have what they call cocaine influencers or like head of circles, I don't know. And you have one guy, uh, his nickname is Bordeaux, and the guy is like, produce, I mean, he's in rap clips, like showing off all his gold and his money and showing his friends. So, I mean, you can sort of track him down a bit. And he's part of a circle that I call, but it's not the proper definition, the Brunswick circle. Basically, Ronnie Brunswick is the vice president of Suriname. So, you know, very important guy. He's running a very important uh, gold business. And he's been... Um, convicted for drug smuggling several times in Europe and is described as many you know knowledgeable observers as head of one of the biggest cocaine smuggling ring in Suriname so if you look at him and then the people surrounding him you can sort of get a sense of who are the public main players of this business not of course all of them but you get a sense of like what is the mood and what are their codes etc and the relationship with between them Another thing was trying to assess how big the situation is in Guyane, in the French territory of Guyane. And I was trying to find the cocaine in Guyane before it is packaged into these capsules that people are selling. So like the big packets, because usually cocaine smugglers 
would ship out uh, packets of cocaine with maybe logos on them or like cultural references, Louis Vuitton logo, I mean, stupid things like this. So I was trying to find this. I didn't find it. But what I found are many, many rap videos of like Guyanese rappers trying to find out again, maybe what are their references? Are they linked somehow to the Suriname people? And you know, trying to evaluate how the network works. Then what I also started to do is collecting all the video reporting that had been done on the sort of trade between, so the route that I was interested in was Colombia to Venezuela, to Suriname, to Guyane, to France. And unfortunately, because you have many news outlets that are fascinated by drug trafficking, like Vice Media, I don't know if you've heard about this, but they are doing a lot of video reporting on drug trafficking, crimes, cartels, gangs, etc. And they have amazing access to these gangs. So sometimes the gangs allow them to film, I don't know, like an operation or something. And luckily, I found one very interesting video from Vice that allowed me to document how the cocaine is shipped from Colombia to Venezuela in part of that, that route that I was studying. All of that with a very simple Google dorking. This is time consuming, of course. And I know that here you heard many people talk about very fancy tools and like complex, I don't know, methodology, but sometimes a good OSINT investigation just starts with simple, efficient Google searches. And you can find many interesting things just doing that. Of course, it's not enough, I guess, but it's a very good starting point. A few dead ends, because that's also very interesting, uh, I think. Uh, what I didn't find enough inf information about to put in my report, uh, and a few leads that I just gave up on because it was too complicated, are the capsule or ovule machines, because now, so I'm just going to show you the picture. On the right, you have the product that people are swallowing inside their stomach or putting it also inside their private parts. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and they are actually very well made. It's like manufactured. It's all the same. It's very, I don't know. Uh, it's very, it's a multitude of layers of plastic. It's compressed. And there were a few mentions of, you know, machines or like, big presses to make them. So I was maybe trying to find them online, see maybe who are the suppliers for such things. But unfortunately, I couldn't find anything about that. So that was a dead end. The only thing I found was this shitty screen grab on the top. Uh, and this was a seizure by the French police in Guyane. But this is the very artisanal way of doing these capsules. It's just like a tiny piston. I don't know the word in English, but yeah. Uh, so dead end for this. Another dead end that I was very disappointed about is how it is shipped through the sea, through boats. So cargo, containers, all the, the cocaine that arrives in maybe Marseille, but mostly Le Havre. Maybe you've heard about big shipments of cocaine arriving in Le Havre. Uh, I was trying to track this down, maybe from Suriname, maybe from Guyane, couldn't find anything about this. Another very interesting topic was the semi-submersible, the cocaine submarines. Maybe you've heard about this on Twitter a bit. A few of them were found in Suriname, but again, couldn't find anything to link that directly to the shipments to Guyane and to France. So I gave up on that one. Those are actually ideas for you to look into as well. I mean, you can keep on this work if you want. Um, I also couldn't find many evidence regarding all the money, money laundering schemes mostly in Guyane and Suriname, like how do these cocaine smugglers, you know, launder the money they produced by smuggling these drugs. I found a few hints on, of course, the gold trade relations between, I mean, the gold trade relations to cocaine trafficking in Suriname. This is like a big, let's say, rumor or th something that many people talk about. But from rumor to evidence, it's a long way and I couldn't find anything uh, strong enough to dive into this. So yeah, maybe if you're interested, you can take notes and maybe continue this work because I think there are foundable things, but I didn't have time to dig into that. Yep, so um, a few limits as well because um, it's important to know them before you start because you're not going to find, 
I don't know, this perfect story of you find, I don't know, a picture of a drug of a cocaine packet in Suriname, there's a logo on it, and then you're able to track it down all the way back to Colombia. That doesn't happen because it's cocaine. It doesn't have a barcode. It doesn't have import-export data of cocaine throughout the world. You don't have all of this as you would have for, I don't know, military equipment or dual use, uh, I don't know, microchips used in missiles, things like that. You have data. This is registered in some way. For cocaine, of course, nothing is registered at any point. Even the chemicals that are used to produce cocaine in Colombia are smuggled. So it's very hard to find tangible evidence and data regarding this topic. Also, I thought that smugglers and traffickers would be more stupid than I found out because None of them, or I couldn't find at least, would slip out operational details on social media. You often find, I don't know, people who are doing scams in Dubai and they're you know, bragging about their lifestyle and then you can track the, them down and find out interesting things about them. I couldn't find anything like that on, I don't know, Instagram of cocaine smugglers. This didn't happen, so it was a limit as well. Um, big limit was that Suriname doesn't have any sort of online business registr registry, sorry. Like, they don't have papers, they don't have any online website where you can dig into companies and their links to one another and the directors, etc., etc. And this is one of the main reasons, I think, that I wasn't able to dig a lot into the money laundering part of this. There was just no data, like nothing. So, yeah, basically without this, you're a bit doomed, I think. And again, uh, cocaine, as I've mentioned before, is, I mean, it's easy to conceal. You can hide it almost anywhere. And it's very profitable, even in small quantities. Like each mule, each person that is swallowing these cocaine capsules, they can swallow maybe one to one and a half kilo each. And it's still profitable business to take that risk each time to, sw to smuggle one and a half kilo. So, you can't track cocaine's like business or like shipments as easily as you would track tons of grains if you're interested in the Russian army plundering Ukraine and then putting all this grain into huge ships and you know having this transferred to maybe Syria. You can see that from a satellite image and you can see the grain being poured on the ships from a satellite image. So it's something very big and very visible. Same goes with, I don't know, armored vehicles that are being shipped by friends to Saudi Arabia, for instance. This was very visible. You had someone filming a harbor in Saudi Arabia and you have the armored vehicles. They're there, you can, I mean, you know they're French. You can you know, track down the supply chain because the objects are big. Here, you don't have this. So you need to work around this a bit. And also, it's a bit dangerous. Uh, I mean, I spoke earlier with uh, Dutch journalists. I don't know if they're here, but I mean, someone, a journalist was killed a few years ago because he investigated the drug trade. So also, you know, you, you need to be a bit careful about digging a lot into the very sensitive areas of this business, such as money laundering, because this is, I mean, money is everything for them. And if you start a touch at this, you might get in danger, so yeah. You need to be careful. Um, and yeah, just an example about how company data is open or not in Suriname. You can see that they have zero at every category. Like they don't have a website with the, the companies. They don't have anything. And just a point of reference, this is how it is for France, which is not perfect in any ways. But you can see that we still have some points, you know, here and there. Suriname, it's just zero everywhere. So. Yeah, it's quite complicated. Um, yep, so as I've mentioned before, um, my ID, you know, having done this sort of pre-research was that I knew it was impossible to track one shipment from beginning to end. It was too complicated, not enough like openly available information out there. So what I decided to do was to document separately each step that I know exists along this route for the cocaine arriving in Paris via Guyane. And this is basically what the route looks like in general. The one I'm interested in is the blue one. So Colombia to Venezuela, Venezuela to Suriname, Suriname to Guyane, and then from Guyane 
mostly um, commercial airlines, like passenger airlines, from Guyane to Paris. And then I didn't dive a lot into this, but from Paris to uh, basically all the small cities in France. So how did I do that? Uh, first, I found all the police reports I could get my hands on. And surprise, none of them are French uh, because there is not a lot of transparency regarding the results of the French law enforcement regarding this topic, but the Brazilians publish everything, which is very good for us. So this is one small example of how what a Brazilian police report looks like. They have huge documents, like 50 pages documents with like all the people they found, all the connections, the planes. On the top right, what you see are codes to illegal airstrips. So basically you just need to use the code like roll Joseph, like each letter equals to a number. And then on the right you have a, like two lines and those are GPS coordinates to an illegal airstrip in Suriname. And they were just handing these pieces of paper to one another just to, you know, like give them directions on like where to pick up the drugs and where to drop it. Another example is this one. So this was a, a report about um, international like drugs bust in Venezuela, which is a sort of transit area for the drug, like coming from Colombia, heading to Suriname. And you can see that they dug some holes near the airstrips to store the drug, because sometimes there's a delay of, of a few days between the drug being dropped off in this area and another plane coming to pick it up and then shipping it to another country. And you have one picture of an illegal airstrip in Venezuela. So all of this is very valuable uh, information when you're trying to piece this all together. Um, and then here comes um, my favorite part, I guess. <laughs> so I was able to find among all these police reports some interesting pictures. This is uh, an international drugs bust in Suriname with the illegal airplane in the background. So you can see it's a very small, I don't know of this, I don't remember this one, I think it's a Cessna or something. It's a very small touristic airplane, the kind of plane you would use, I don't know, for uh, visiting or tourism, things like that. And the police picked, like, took photos of the big batches, the big packs of cocaine they found on board inside the plane. They were trying to drop off this drug in Suriname. And what was interesting is that they let this out. So this is um, a sort of bag that is used for agricultural purposes. And it was very easy to find where is this shop. And it's actually in a city called Villa Vicencio in Colombia. So I was like, okay, it's interesting. I have an illegal airstrip in Suriname, very close to the capital. It's not like a remote jungle airstrip. It's like 20 kilometers of the capital in an urban area. And they find, I think this time they find 500 kilos of cocaine. And on the bags you have a shop name directly in Colombia. I was like, okay, this is good, but maybe, you know, I can dig a bit more. And what I found was this Vice video. They were following um, a Colombian cartel called Clan del Golfo, it's a very big one, and they were basically showing off in front of vice cameras that they were able to ship cocaine with these kind of planes very easily because they just have everyone on their payroll in Colombia. So they were just bragging about the fact that, you know, it's so corrupt here, it's so easy, we can do whatever we want. And, of course, they tried to blur many things in the video report. The faces, of course, also all the numbers that appear on a plane, they blurred everything. But I was able to find this moment in the video. It's when the plane leaves an airport to join the, the cartel in a remote area. And this airport is this one. I, like, geolocated it. I, I think people told you before about geolocation, but basically you just compare visual elements in a landscape and establish that this is exactly the same location. Here you can see that they have exactly the same tower, like buildings, mountain in the back, etc., etc. Like compared to this one, you can see that it's exactly the same place. And this is Villa Vicencio Airport, again. Again, Villa Vicencio comes up. And 
then the, air, the, the airplane arrives in this remote location to pick up the drug. And again, I was able to find where it was exactly, so it was a very lost, kind of abandoned airstrip in the Colombian countryside, but still very close to Villa Vicencio. And then they say in the report that it was headed to Venezuela. So this is one example of like how I tried to document every step of this traffic, but separately. Like I couldn't find this, like what they were showing in the report. Sorry, yeah. So in the back you can see the, the yellow stri stripped sort of bags. This is the cocaine. I wasn't able to find where these two bags went to because it's impossible. But I was able to see a bit how this works in Colombia to get it out of Colombia, mostly to Venezuela, via these planes. So, yep. so Venezuela. So that's one example, and basically I did all that for all the steps uh, of this route. Then I tried, but it was a bit uh, very time consuming, I tried to map the networks. As you maybe remember, the Brazilian police report had so many names in them and so many names linked to one another. And then I had also other resources. So I tried to map them all together. This is a very important thing to do, very time consuming, but then you can sort of, you can start to see patterns. And in this case, this allowed me to, s to see how all those guys in Suriname that are very involved in what's going on in Guyane are basically using a, Bra a Brazilian gang or cartel as a subsidiary to transport their drugs through these planes. So it was quite interesting. Um, also, just quick notes on like, it, it doesn't need to be a fancy software. It doesn't need to be super well organized. I mean, you can do amazing OSINT investigations just using a spreadsheet and being a bit methodical about collecting evidence. And this is basically how I did it. I had so many columns and like planes with the plane names, the people involved, maybe the people arrested. Maybe sometimes, I don't know, an organization was named when they were discovered, things like that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, a quick note again. Yeah. Another interesting part was, so we have these planes. They are very small. And of course, they don't turn on their signal when they're, you know, going from Venezuela to Suriname. They're just turning off everything they are in dark mode and they're just going over the jungle trying not to be detected by law enforcement and just landing in some random illegal airstrip in Suriname dropping off the load they have inside and I was like yeah okay but how do we verify this because this is just basically rumors or observers you know commenting about this in the media but you can't see anything you don't have any evidence of that, or you don't have any visual evidence of that, at least to the you know, general audience or the public. Maybe some law enforcement have evidence, but we don't have. So let's see what we can see from the sky. And for that, I use Sentinel Hub. So this is a website that allows you to browse through many different low to medium satellite imagery for free. So you don't have the very, I don't know, impressive HD satellite images of Maxar, but you still have some valuable information in them. And I used this website to do two things, to detect all the illegal airstrips in Suriname, and also to de detect uh, airplanes, because sometimes you, ha you are lucky and the satellite takes an image while a plane is flying. And you can see it, and I will show you in a minute. So. Basically, how I did to find the illegal airstrips. I just spent a lot of time <laughs> uh, browsing on the maps of Suriname, looking at images, and trying to detect these sort of very straight, a bit wide strips of bare land in the middle of the jungle. And this is very distinctive of like, I mean, this is an airstrip, we're sure of that, and we verified it afterwards, but Basically, you're just looking around on the satellite images, trying to find 
this sort of anomaly. This is an anomaly in a forest. This isn't natural. This isn't supposed to be. And if you can verify afterwards, yeah, you have evidence of the existence of an airstrip. You can see because you have images almost every two to three days. So you can see when they started digging it, when they finished. And sometimes you see some of them are starting to have some vegetation grow back. So maybe you can assume that they don't use it anymore. Um, and how do you know it's an illegal airstrip and not some official airstrip that is just a bit simple? Well, you can actually find a database of all the official airstrips. So they have a lot in Suriname. But when you cross-check this with the data you find in the satellite images, then you're able to come up with this map, which is all the illegal airstrips still in activity in Suriname. And that's a lot. It's a tiny country. I don't know, maybe it's the size of Brittany in France or something like this. It's, it's very, very small. And the populated area is just by the coast in the north. The rest is just primary jungle. So it's a lot of airstrips for such a small population. And obviously, you can assume that probably those airstrips are being constructed for illegal purposes. One of the ways we have of confirming that those airstrips are indeed airstrips is by asking commercial satellite providers for an HD satellite image. This is Maxar. And maybe you can see, I don't know if I can show my mouse. Yes, you can see there's a plane here. And this was actually a plane that was eventually discovered by the Surinamese police and they found, they didn't find drugs inside, but they assumed it was drugs because they found all the, I mean, otherwise necessary equipment for smuggling cocaine, such as jerry cans of petrol and the guys had fled, etc. They had extra reservoirs to prolong their trip, etc., etc. So yeah, those are the illegal airstrips. I couldn't find any in Guyane. So probably they don't exist there because maybe we have, we're not a narco state yet. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah, I tried to apply the same methodology for Guyane and didn't, didn't come up with anything. So yeah, some sources told me that maybe they would want to start something like this, but the risk is much higher because there is less, way less corruption in Guyane than in Suriname. So probably people, if they got discovered, would actually end up in jail. And yeah, maybe that's not a good idea. About detecting planes while flying in the sky. Uh, it looks like this. So here you can't see much, but can you see maybe an anomaly in the picture? I don't know if the lighting is good enough, but basically in the center, you have a red dot, a green dot, and a blue dot. And this is actually because um, the satellite images that are taken and that are available on this website are what we call multispectral. So basically, it first takes the red layer of the visible like, uh, land, and then the green, and then the blue. But there is a bit of a difference, a time difference, a, a few seconds of time in between each layer. So if an object is moving, it will appear as a, a, a red, green, and blue dot. The blue dot is being the last one that is being taken indicates in which direction the object is moving. So this works for planes, and this works for boats as well. Um, and basically, I just highlighted that so that you can see a bit better. This is what it looks like. So how do you detect this? Um, this is um, a bit of the technical hiccup it's because of course Suriname is not so big as I've said I think it's the size roughly of Brittany in France but still you have to go through all the images available we started the process at like I mean our starting date is 2020 up until early 2023 so that's a lot and I told you one image is every two to three days so that's a lot of images and then you have the whole country to cover because of course those planes are flying like, I don't know, in the deep forest, et cetera, et cetera. So what I did is that I called for help and I asked uh, a fellow OSINT investigator to help me build a script to do this automatically. So basically it was based on 
Sentinel Hub, the provider of these images, as an API that you can use, and then a Python script was already created previously for another project, so he took that, uh, customized it a bit, and then was able to go through, I think, a bit more than a thousand um, satellite images, and from that, we came up with uh, 64 results. So we detected 64 planes using this method. But then, of course, this doesn't tell you who owns the plane, what kind of plane it is, is it legal, is it illegal? So how do you do that? Well, you go back to your traditional like flight tracking services using ADSB data. And what we did again with another colleague is that we used the API of three websites. So Flight Radar, Radar Box, and ADSB Exchange. And because at Le Monde, we installed an ADSB, ADSB antenna on the roof, uh, <laughs> we have free access to these websites. So we were able to cross-reference all these 64 flights to the official data and come up with the result that one quarter of the flights that the satellite capture were illegal. They didn't air any sort of signal. So there's two possibilities. Either they are an illegal flight, that they, they just turn off their ADSB signal, which is illegal. Either they are a military airplane, because military airplanes are allowed, of course, to turn off their signal, not to be detected, et cetera, et cetera. So you, of course, if you go to flight radar, you don't see, I mean, the jets and all the things. But uh, the thing is, Suriname doesn't have any fighter jets. They just have three helicopters. So the chance for them to be each time an helicopter on these images is very low. So we assume that all those flights that we identified as not airing their ADSB signal were actually most likely illegal planes. And that was good because we were able to put out some sort of tangible information, tangible data that shows that there is a big illegal activity going on in Suriname. And it's not just some expert telling it, or it's not just some observer telling it, or an anonymous source in an article. We can actually show it. Like, it's visible, and we can prove it. So yeah, this is the, again, very simple spreadsheet to compare all the detected flights to the available ADSB data that we found. Uh, and that's how we came up with the, with the results. Um, yeah, so a quick word about collaboration. Um, this would never have been possible without time, that's for sure. A lot of time, a lot of obsessiveness, I guess, but also help from the OSINT community. First of all, my colleagues, uh, one of my colleagues helped me build this to you know, verify the flights, I mean, verify that flights uh, that we detected with satellites didn't air any signal. And also, um, a guy that is running this very interesting blog called Line of Actual Control. His name is Riley, and he's the one who customized the Python script to detect the, the planes on the satellite images. He is now hired by the New York Times, of course, because he is brilliant. Um, but yeah, it wouldn't have been possible without him and with, without many other people that helped me. So as with many OSINT investigations, it's very important to be uh, collaborative and to help each other out uh, because, yeah, we are not, uh, we can't be experts of everything and we need sometimes help and in this case it was very valuable. Uh, if you're interested in um, tracking down cocaine smugglers, I put out a document, so it's in French but it's mostly links, so you can find uh, many things on there. I put all the links to the Python scripts, to all the resources we used uh, on this document. It's also available below the YouTube video that you can find online. Um, so yeah, feel free to take a picture of this and look it out afterwards. Um, a quick note, um, this is still going on. So translation, Guyane, 11 police of like, uh, I don't know how to translate exactly, but. 
11 police officers are suspected of having smuggled cocaine through France and they are not now in custody. So basically another thing that we found out during this investigation is that many people are claiming that this exists because only because Guyane is a poor area of France and there are many young people who don't know what to do with their lives and don't know, don't know how to make money. So they resort to smuggling cocaine by swallowing it and smuggling to France. This is of course partly true, but also you find many sort of very educated, well-positioned in society people that are also taking part in this business because it's so lucrative. So yeah, um, a quick note that this is still going on. It's not finished. Also, I had some people telling me, oh yeah, we reinforced all the controls and everything. So it's going to be over in a few weeks. Well, the, publish the video was published a few months ago now, like four months ago, and this article came out a few days ago. So probably this is still going on. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, we have plenty of time. Uh, and just, yeah, if you want, I have Twitter. And also, since I'm representing Open Facto Nonprofit, uh, if you have questions you want to ask more in private, I will be upstairs the rest of the afternoon and happy to talk, uh, exchange emails, anything. Thank you. Thank you very, mu Thank you very much, Lizlot. It was very, very, very interesting. Please don't do cocaine smuggling, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Liz Lott is watching you. Yeah, sorry, I didn't put the warnings like, this is dangerous, don't do this, blah, blah, yeah, but for sure. it was a bit obvious, right? Yeah, <laughs> and remember about operation security, guys, when you do that kind of investigations. It's very important. Yes, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I had a question. Um, uh, why didn't you... Uh, put uh, into your scope uh, Panama, because Panama is uh, providing a uh, lot of uh, chemicals for uh, Colombian uh, labs, and it would be a good way to, well, to track them, to track, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I tried to track, like, the ingredients for cocaine, like the, because cocaine requires a lot of chemicals and in huge quantities to be produced. The problem is that I am, my format is 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes to put information in, in a video and I had to make choices. And since my starting point was cocaine arriving in France through Guyane, I couldn't go back too much further. So yeah, I had to make choices for the investigation. Uh, but that would be, yeah, a good investigation to start if you're <laughs> interested. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to know if you have ever been uh, felt in danger during your investigation, um, because you talked about Dutch uh, journalists that have been threatened, also killed by the yes. Mokro Mafia, I think, something like yeah, this. Yeah, in Antwerp, I think, if I remember correctly. Yep. Uh, have you felt um, threats during the investigations on uh, on French uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't receive any threats. Uh, don't start now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, no, it was fine for me. I just spoke with a few people that were very, very worried to talk to me about this. So that's how I felt sort of the, you know, the pressure and the danger surrounding this topic. But me personally, I didn't receive any threats and I, I'm fine. I hope it stays this way. <laughs> yeah. But also I didn't reveal, sorry, but this is important. I didn't reveal anything that was completely unknown. I just put out their visual evidence and additional documentation to routes that were already known that we just didn't have any sort of, yeah, details about them. But, and also I didn't touch, I mean, I didn't go into the money laundering. I think that's also one of the main reasons they didn't probably feel threatened by this investigation is that I didn't reveal anything that maybe law enforcement wouldn't be aware of already. It's just, yeah, like, visual elements showing what they're doing, but not re revealing something we don't know at all. Yep. Yes, bonjour. Um, did you, because you mentioned the ingredients, did you mention any, or at least notice any influence from Chinese importers into the country or Chinese presence? So that's where you mean from. in Guyane or in Suriname? 
in, throughout your research, like, no. did you see any influence from the, the chemicals imported from there? No, I know that the Chinese are uh, very big players in the mesamphetamine uh, production because, yeah, I think m most of the com components that go into the production are uh, made in China. But for cocaine, I didn't see anything. I saw the influence of other countries, but I don't really want to talk about them, <laughs> but not China. Yeah. Yep. Just, just to tell you concerning the boats, um, cocaine follows the commercial uh, yeah. movements too, and bananas yeah. in, in particular, or supposed bananas, and Europol's article are very interesting about that, concerning the seizure of Europol, and it's the first step. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean, yeah, many like very random goods. I know also that flowers coming from Colombia are widely used as well. I mean, many different kind of common objects are used to smuggle them. That's also why they're very hard to track from an OSINT perspective, because I can't open a container with a satellite image to see if there is cocaine inside a banana. So it's, yeah, it's just maybe law enforcement here that will open the container in Le Havre and maybe test it and find out there's cocaine. But from my perspective, I don't think there's much we can do from an OSINT perspective, yeah. Uh, hello, uh, I was wondering, do you know if uh, traffickers and smugglers are reading uh, your kind of investigation and are <laughs> adapting, you know, uh, they know that they are doing mistakes, they know that they can be traced and followed, do you know if they adapt and change their habits? Um, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I haven't heard anything specific, like, I don't know, this investigation having had any kind of influence. But the thing is, I didn't delve in too much into this right now, but Suriname is so corrupt. I mean, unless the country changes drastically, cocaine smugglers have a free range. So even if it, it's known, because there everyone knows, I mean, like it's, it's out there on the streets and people don't really fret about it. So yeah, they're not really threatened. Um, so I don't think it would change that much, to be honest. But it's just my opinion. I don't have any facts to base this on. Yep. Yet. Yeah. Um, one question. You have data on uh, a number of flights that you see in uh, two to three days pictures. Yep. Did you try to extrapolate to have data on how many uh, you didn't see because you don't have the images? Or how many? The, what's the volume of planes uh, in reality? with the data you have to kind of get a rough estimation of the number of planes more globally and the money that it would represent? Yeah, no, I didn't do that. Uh, I think it would be possible with a lot of time. Um, what we did is that we had all these flights that were detected, and then from all these flights, we separated the legal ones from the illegal ones. So we thought that was enough to get a sort of rough idea of, like, the pregnancy of illegal flights in this country and the fact that they don't have basically air control, like it's a non-existent air control situation in Suriname. Um, but yeah, no, we didn't do what you did. I wish we could have done that, but I mean, I already spent so much time doing this, we couldn't do everything. Yeah, but it's a good idea, actually, yeah. Yep. Hi, uh, I have a question about Sentinel Hub and the illegal airstrip. I wanted to know if it was possible to monitor the activities on the illegal airstrip using SAR imagery on Sentinel Earth because it was possible for the Russian invasion or other military um, yeah. big movements. So this was my initial idea using radar imagery. So it's basically an image that is uh, detecting through radar. So it can basically see through clouds at night. So it's not a visual thing. It's like, uh, I don't know how to explain, but. Anyway, you got it. Um, the problem is that these SAR images are, have a very lower resolution than the, the ones that I used. And they have basically, if an object is smaller than 10 meters, you can't see it. So it's, it's, it's useful for you know, a military camp or a big building or very big planes like commercial airlines. But if it's a Cessna, you can't see anything. So that's why we had to go 
with the like normal um, optical images, not the radar ones. Um, but in theory, for other topics, it's it's possible. Yeah. And on the optical images we analyzed, we could see like, you know, some sort of signs that it was active because the the Earth was not regrowing at all for long periods of time, and then maybe starts to regrow. So we we assume that probably this one was abandoned, but we couldn't see much more than this. We, I hoped to see, I don't know, trucks or other planes, things like that, but you, you can't be that lucky all the time. <laughs> yeah. Do we have more questions? Nope. Please, applause this lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.